Dr. Andy Gunther. Andy was trained in 2007 in Nashville, so one of the earliest, uh, one of the earliest groups to get trained. And uh, he got his PhD at UC Berkeley. Go and Bears. Go Bears. Yeah. Go Bears. Yeah. Go Bears. Yeah. Right here. And way back in 1987, he's currently the executive director for the Center of Ecosystem Management and Restoration. And I know our, and basically in the Bay Area, very conscious about the impact of climate change on our Bay Area, right? So I've seen that you've done a good number of talks on the impacts, and I know that in past meetups, we've, we've expressed a lot of interest in that topic as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to Andy, and, and welcome, you. welcome here. Thank right. you. So, you know, my, my personal story is the seeds. And in fact, when we were talking in my group, it was seeds, some of the data, and particularly when the I score data came back in our and, and, you know, speak up. So, 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 um, are we a, do I have a Is it, are we a role in here? There we go. Okay, look at that. Thank you. Okay, so what I want to try to do tonight is to give you guys a little sense of how I talk about some of the science, but I'm going to do it in a way that makes you feel like you can talk about it as well. Because a lot of times, this is what I have heard from other presenters is like, well, I'm not a scientist, how can I talk about it? Well, your personal story, as we were just talking about, is fundamental for connecting to your audience. But the evidence that we have changed the planet is really important to share with them as well. Okay? And when we when we do a presentation, when we start with our, our opening statement, you know, you have an opportunity to connect with people, and you don't stand up and say, hi, I'm Andy, and I'm going to talk to you about climate science. You have to stand up and tell people why they should listen to you. You've got 45 seconds before they pull out their iPhone, right? <laughs> why should I listen to you? And so I'm going to spin you a little bit about what my opening statement looks like. In particular, I've been attempting to speak to conservative audiences. So why should they listen to me? And so what I do is, my wife and I have two children. Like all parents, we want our kids to grow up in a world that's safe, and healthy, and productive, and they, my parents have heard <coughs> their grandparents, and today, I want to talk to you about why the world scientific community is saying that my, our future, and particularly our children's future, is going to take a serious turn to the worst unless we take immediate action. But before I do that, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. Okay? I'm not going to tell you what they're going to do. Who am I to tell you? I don't even know you. Who am I to tell you what to do, right? And I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong. We all have our own values that we use to determine what's right or wrong. But what I am going to tell is about the scientific evidence that says we have a really big problem. And in doing this, I'm going to ask you to listen to the skeptics. The real skeptics, the scientists. Because objective skepticism is the heart of the scientific about the science. One of the, the way that I do it, which I think is a way that non-scientists can do it as well, is to tell the story about the history of climate science. Because this is a story that you don't have to be a scientist to tell. And I think you don't have to be a you don't have to be a scientist to tell this story. I'm going to start talking louder. Okay. And the, so and this is the kind of show you a couple extra slides that aren't in the, the slide deck that you've got. But you can go to just a couple different websites. There's one uh, that the American um, Institute of Physics has, the, the history of global warming. Um, it starts with this guy, Forty. Now, one of the reasons I put this up is so I can say a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson. So immediately, we're taken to a different place. Fourier marched with Napoleon. He was the governor of South Egypt for a while, or the, the emperor of Napoleon. But he also, in 1830, realized, based upon, once we learned how far away the sun was, that the Earth should be a colder place than it is. And it's he who postulated that there must be a layer of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere in 1833. And so, so and then I, I, that's how I tee up and talking about 
about the greenhouse. This is the, this is, these are the slides right from the deck. I'll give you my, my, how I talk about the greenhouse effect, just to model what we do. The Earth gets almost all of its energy from the sun. Most of the sun's rays pass through the atmosphere, striking the planet, warming up, and just like anything else that warms up, a frying pan and a stove or a log <coughs> fireplace, the Earth begins to radiate heat in the form of infrared radiation. Now, most of that radiation escapes out into space, but in our atmosphere, there is this layer of heat-trapping gases that absorb some of that outgoing radiation and send it back down to the planet, warming it further, and that's why the Earth has the temperature that it does. Mars, which has a very thin atmosphere and a very weak greenhouse effect, is a very cold place, while Venus has a very thick atmosphere, very powerful greenhouse effect, and has a surface temperature close to that of old planet. And it's not because of the relative Now, over the last 250, 300 years, humans have been adding prodigious amounts of heat trapping gases to the atmosphere, mainly by the burning. We can, we can, in, let's do the Q&A. Let me just do a couple more things. I've, I'm hoping, I'm not even gonna talk for 20 minutes, so that we have a lot of time for Q&A. Um, I just wanna do a couple of things. So, so this is a graph that you, um, you have, you know, I tell people that it's hotter, one thing that you really do need to talk about, because you'll hear it is, there hasn't been any global warming in the last 15 years, right? Okay, so the, you draw the line. Now, if, if you've been following this, what you, what you know is, first of all, the line is 2000, uh, the, uh, you know, 2014, now 2015 is going to make this ridiculous. But the, the, the point here is that what I tell people is, you don't hear there's been no global warming in 15 years anymore. You hear there's been no global warming in 17 years. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, because if you look for the last 15 years, this is what you see, okay? And the point here is not that this means there's runaway global warming, because it does. It means that you a 15 year long period you can make it do whatever you want by when you start the line, okay? But if you draw a line that's 35 years long, you can't do that. It's going up. Andy, can I? Yeah. I'm sorry, can I interrupt you a bit? Yeah. Um, I really want you guys to see the sunset, because one thing I think that's really important is that we savor the earth that we're on, <laughs> and we really understand what we're fighting for. So you guys gotta come down and see the sunset. talked about the idea that you take a 35 year line, 35 year long line segment here, you 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 can only conclude that things are that it's going up. Now one of the a, a one question that you hear often is well wait, I mean humans are we're really adaptable creatures, right? We can we can manage. Well, why is it that we can't manage what's coming? And and so you can access uh, uh, proxy measurements of so this is the Earth's temperature. This came off of Joe Rome's website, Climate Progress. Um, but what this shows us is that over the 10,000 year history of human civilization, there has been change, about a degree Fahrenheit. But what you can see is that what's suddenly happening is unlike anything that we have seen in the past. Now, the um, the other thing that it's important to recognize, and if you use this picture, which um, I think appears, this appears at the end of the video, right? Yeah. Let's go back to the last slide. Uh, yeah. The, uh, your, the projector is not showing the red line, as you can see, as it interrupts the horizontal axis. Yeah. You know what? Because that, yeah, the I know. filter is working, not working. This is the most alarming graph you can show. So Peter is pointing out that. That, so what I have actually, I have a, another slide I didn't transfer, uh, correctly transfer it onto the back. I'm running this off another computer, not off of my computer. But 
Yet, but what you, if you then look at what the projections are, you can see the break here, right? So I have a red line. The, red, the, the temperature where we're going is just, is just straight up. It just, this just continues straight up. Um, now, one of the most important <coughs> questions is about how do we know that it's us? And so the, there are a variety of different ways that you can talk about this. There's a, the website Skeptical Science is a wonderful resource, and they have a single infographic that gives you all the fingerprints about why it is that that we know that it's us. Um, but using the slide deck, using an important slide from the slide deck, I want to tell you how what, the way I have come to talk about it. <coughs> it's, it's something, again, that I think is a way that even if you are not a scientist, it's easy to grasp. That is that the Earth is really big. It's so big that there are very <coughs> few things that are strong enough to change its temperature. And science has only come up really with three. One is that the Earth's orbit changes over time. It goes from being more circular to more elliptical. And when it's more elliptical, the planet spends more time farther away from the sun. That's one of the things that drives the ice ages. But that happens on the order of 100,000 years. That can explain what we're seeing. OK, so what else? Well, the output of the sun varies in strength. And it varies in cycles that are 10 to 20 years. Ah, OK. So it could be the sun. The problem is that the changes are not very powerful. When you look at the temperature that the nat these natural features would cause, and this is when I, I use the slide, <coughs> this slide, which I assume is still in the slide deck. Does this look familiar to you guys? Sure. So, OK. So this is from Tim Barnett's lab in, in UC, at UC San Diego. Here's what the temperature of the ocean should be from these natural factors. And you can see the impact of volcanic eruptions, mm -hmm. which are the volcanic eruptions put a lot of dust into the atmosphere, and they shade the Earth, but just temporarily. And then gravity pulls those particles out. And then when you say, well, so when we put the impact of greenhouse gases in, then what is the, what is the temperature? And when you do that, that's what, that's what this is. OK? And now we have, we have ourselves a hypothesis. The temperature of the ocean is this, or it's this. And how do we answer that? We measure the temperature of the ocean. And when we do that, this is what we see. The fundamental point here to try and communicate to your audience and I want to communicate to you, is that greenhouse gases, the impact of greenhouse gases, is the only thing that we know that can cause or that can explain what we are observing. The temperature changes we are observing in the air, on the planet, in the, in the ocean, the only thing that explains them is the impact of greenhouse gases. And there is no explanation as well for why greenhouse gases are not causing it. Those are actually two different things, right? And in fact, this is why the Supreme Court made the decision it did in 2007, when it said carbon dioxide <coughs> is a pollutant as defined in the Clean Air Act and it can be regulated. It should be regulated by EPA because it's a threat to public health and safety. Because there was not another explanation that the justices could understand. Even the dissenting justices, they were, Justice Roberts was dissenting on technicalities about standing or whatever. 
So it, it's just the very basic thing there. There's no other explanation for what we are seeing. When you look at the actual energy, the, the greenhouse gases are adding about three watts of energy per square meter. The sun's changes are on the order of a tenth of a watt per square meter. And so this is the difference in the power here. Well, we'll wait till the rest of it. Okay, okay. And then the last thing I just want to talk about is these set these these sets of slides about temperatures. Okay. I have found these are these are pretty stunning to me. Um, the the thing to point out here, first of all, is that this is a 30 year average, this this distribution of temperatures. And as you would expect, when you average over 30 years, there are some places on the planet that are a little warmer, there's some places on the planet that are a little colder, and there's a central tendency. Now, the theory of global warming makes a prediction. And again, this is science in action. You make a prediction and then you test that prediction and you either, it either is, is substantiated or it's falsified. The theory of global warming tells us this distribution of temperatures should go towards the warm side and it should become more variable. And that, of course, is exactly what happens as you walk through these set of slides. <coughs> and remember, these are measurements. There's no model here. This is just what we're measuring in the Northern Hemisphere over <coughs> the last 40 years. And so now, we're in this situation where what used, this, the, what used to be the, the the, what used to be uh, uh, average is now, the average is now warmer, and we're getting this whole constellation of temperatures on the planet that are way beyond what we've seen in the past. And that's what that box, that's the point that that box is making. And so with that, um, I, uh, the, the only other scientific point I just wanted to make was about sea level rise. And there are very, various, uh, uh, presentations you can make about sea level rise. The point here is that all of these graphs, all the lines are going up, right? They, the rate of sea level rise is going to accelerate into the future. So with that, I want to stop now because I think there are probably lots of questions and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, Carter, do you want to? Yeah, I have a couple of, of thoughts and comments actually. Um, one is, I don't, so you say you're speaking to conservative audiences. Uh, and this is how you're trying to get the science across. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if these are carefully you know, assembled audiences of people or they're assembled. whoever I can. Right. So it's hard to get an invitation. I, so the thing about like, the conservative audience that I think we don't often talk about is that the reasons why the conservative audience is you know, doesn't want to believe global warming is because the remedies proposed are the problem That's and correct. the implications of government control ideology. So to, to start with that might be the more disarming thing. In other words, to point out that, that the, the, the solutions proposed, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm not asking you to accept. You might, even, you might even go so far as to say the solutions we've got on the table aren't even going to be enough anyway. You know, but here's the you know, but here's the science. But if you don't do that, the reason I bring it up is because if you don't do that, those defenses are all still there. If you don't acknowledge that you're having two different conversations, you know that you're talking about science, but they're thinking about government. Um, you're you're still talking. You're, you're going to be ships passing in the night. So you say bring that up. Okay. I would I would bring that up up front. I would be I'm completely agnostic about what we should do about any of this, even. You know, if I was if I knew I had a fully conservative audience, I would you know would acknowledge that right up front. Well, what I, I thought I don't know, but the that's idea. the part about saying I'm not going to tell you what to believe. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong, and and um, I'm only going to talk about evidence. I'm trying to I, say I, I would go so far as so I'm not going to tell you what you should be doing because well, that's also what people are defending against. They but don't I also don't. Tell that's my. That's the whole. The, what I'm where, the, when I'm talking, I don't even. I never get to solutions. I don't. I, it comes up. If it comes up in Q and A, I'm like, yes. <laughs> now we have moved past the 
the denial of, of science. But there's, but there's, this is at what Carter said about the fact that people are, the solutions are, they think, they have been told that if they accept the science, they will have to take actions that are inimical to their own personal <coughs> values. This, the, this is what they have been told, and they won't even think about it. And I think that's, that's, you know, so that's, I mean, the implications still might be tragic for their personal values, and certainly their values about government, et cetera. But, and that's worth acknowledging as well. Um, you know, but anyway, the point being that I, I, if I were you, or if I, or I would think in this situation, I would be, I would be a little more explicit about that. Okay. Um, yeah, let's keep getting the, some the, other the, 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 other, the quick some other thought is that this, this framing this question of the science around does carbon dioxide explain the temperature rise, we keep getting caught into that. Rather than we know we're emitting CO2, do we see the effects we would expect? Finding opportunities to flip that, order that question is really also quite important, I think. So. Okay, great. Why don't we keep getting some other yes. people involved? Just in case anyone missed it, that last slide, which was very beneficial, uh, the credentials on the bottom said NASA. And now, all I have to do is tell my audience that, and that's going to sell it. Because they can look at charts and say, okay, okay. But then they see NASA, and, or Stephen Hawking, or something, and that says it. Well, that's a great, that's a very important, so I've had people come up to me and say, wow, all of your slides have the source of information on them. <laughs> then you have to well, I guess you're not making this well. Okay, but then that's even that's you're getting into really the fine point about who's, whose data should I show, and I think that's really important. And yeah. you can say, can say NASA, say NASA. You know, yeah. wear your NASA T-shirt if that's what it's going to take. Yeah, I have a question about where you saw the spike, where it went straight up on the graph. So um, we're talking. About, so we're talking about twelve thousand years. So now. Yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. So at the beginning, you showed the different temperatures of Venus and Mercury and all that, and mm -hmm. talked about the relationship to Earth. Are those planets experiencing any spike right now? Because that would be very interesting. Because that, if they aren't, then that, then no big say we're going through this through part of our solar system. So one of the arguments that is made is that, in theory, other planets are warming up. And therefore, the implication is, therefore, it's, it's something, okay? So if, if someone throws it at you, there are a couple of things to say. First of all, But are we, they, what I'm asking you is, are the other planets? The, Mars, I, I think the spike. temperatures on, no, not, they're not spiking yeah. like this. No, and, and, and there's nothing, there is no mechanism that we would explain why the temperatures are going to rise the way all of our our models show they are going to rise on the planet. Because so, I think wasn't one of the people who deny it say we're our whole system is traveling through an orbit where we're getting to a certain part in space and well the, the, there's the, the physics of this people cite Neptune well like Neptune we haven't even known about Neptune. Neptune, Neptune, one year on Neptune is 248 years, Earth years, right? We, we're just seeing, we might be seeing seasonal changes, we're seeing the impact of, of various uh, environmental changes on those planets, dust in the atmosphere, and things like we don't even understand. We don't have, we don't have, we don't have a, a set of temperature data, but it, it's not, we, the, these are like, these are explanations <coughs> They're, 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 they're ideas looking for, for science to underlie them. Whereas this is, and this gets to what Mark was saying, this, there is, the explanation for this is clear because we know what's happening in our atmosphere. And, and there isn't another way, the sun's variation, soul, uh, uh, cosmic radiation, none of these things are related to the change we're seeing, like, like carbon dioxide. Yeah. All right, yeah. Three more questions and oh, three quick questions, three quick answers. This is very complex. And I'm trying to figure out if, but if our troposphere is getting hotter, our stratosphere is actually getting colder. That's correct. Because we have this heat budget is the same. It's our atmosphere, on average, is the same. It's just that that part that we live in, where the weather is, the troposphere is getting warmer. If 
they measure the stress, and that's why I mentioned the lenticular clouds, stratospheric clouds. They're very fleecy. They're, they're, they measure the stress. They're actually getting colder. Well, the temperature, the temperatures that that NASA and the Japanese Meteorological Society and the temperature graphs you see, um, where is where I went the other way? That these are these are tropospheric temperatures, and the the um, yeah. So this is the tropospheric temperature. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's and that's one of the finger, <laughs> one of the footprint, one of the one of the key fingerprints here is if it was the sun. Then, then the stratosphere would be warming, right. but it's not. Right. So the, t the, the heat oh. is coming from the, from the planet into the troposphere. That's right. Well, that would be a good one. I don't know. I want to make it. If that was my point. All right. Yeah. Got to get to the next question. Just to give everybody a chance. Wait, wait how long is your talk? Yeah. All right. All right. One here and then Friday here. Mark? Right. So quick question and comments. On the one with the uh, graph of the temperatures, I, I understand it's in standard deviations, but it also begs the question of what is it in terms of temperature? So if, if you go to that one quickly. Um, right, it's, it's uh, the bar charts. Mm -hmm. Right. It, no, it's, it's, the, it's the distributions. The distributions, yeah. Right. I, I mean, you can look at that. And the first time I saw it, I was thinking degrees, and it took me a while to sort of re register. Right. But is, it, if the question comes up, is there basically an answer, or are you just saying? No, well, this is this is this is the. It, it, I mean, technically, it is the deviation from, of the mean. But what I'm the way I do this is to say, you know, it gets warmer going this way, and it gets more variable going as it spreads out. But if I wanted to know, if is one deviation, you know, half a degree or five degrees, or if somebody at, were to ask that question, do we simply sidestep it, or I don't have that. Answer? Well, I don't from, have that right from in a, my from sort of a six sigma standard deviation perspective. It's based upon the data that they would have there, yeah, it, and yeah. so it's it's you're talking in terms of six. You know, that's five standard deviations. But it, it will also yeah. come come back to a deviation is relative to degrees in this this sure. relationship. You so, you can for each one of these you could say that the I keep pushing the wrong button. So. This, this, the, you now have the central tendency is now a different temperature. Yeah. Yes, and and the point is just to see the change over time, and that's why it's presented in this way. That, so, that's so how. Not, so it's not quantified in terms of temperature, and I, I guess that's okay. You, no, I mean if you go back to Hansen's paper, I'm sure that you can get for <coughs> this decade, you can get an actual average temperature. It's presented. The reason I, I wanted to present it this way is, of course, because this is what's in the slide deck. Right. But, but All right. You, just you, you, okay. you, you know what one deviation is. I mean, that's if it's a that normal distribution, yeah, that's right. That, that is that is there. That that number is it does exist. Oh sure. Oh yeah. I mean, you could you yeah. Once you know what what the what this mean is, and if this is a normal deviation, but, right, but, but what it's saying is that the know. process is shifting. That that's it's saying that none of these are random. That it's the process shift. All right, great, thank you. Uh, we always have a lot of questions, but time is a little shorter. Okay, Friday, did you have? I do, but I'm not sure actually that my question is. Okay, scientific, so you can skip. All right, go back to the one in the back there, then. Michelle. That first graph was based on 1960, and therefore there is a mean temperature. Do you know the mean temperature from which all the other deviations are derived? No, I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's in, it's in Hansen's paper. This is from Jim Hansen's paper, but the, and in fact, it's probably in the, the, the paper itself is in the notes section, I bet. Um, and, uh, um, but again, the point is not what the absolute value is. The point right. is that the change is happening, and it's happening relatively quickly. Well, okay. Again, just, just for the presentation, it, this is a complicated thing. So when you're giving this to an audience, I mean, you know, it would be helpful, like, you know, be, what you ask, to be able to have a number very easily, because a lot of people don't get this. And, and once you start diluting with other complications, it takes away maybe from the bigger picture sometimes. All right. Okay. <laughs> Peter, all right. Then we have to, sorry, but again, we have to, we have our next speaker. So, so um, Quick. speaking yeah. of Hansen, uh, a lot crystallized for me when I heard Hansen speak about Earth's energy balance. That's when I really understood why the planet is warming. And I always try to include that in my talk because. These graphs, this math, these standard deviations, most people don't have the faintest idea of what a bell curve is and all that. Hmm. 
But if you describe in layman's terms uh, energy balance, you're taking in more than you're getting, than you're leaving, than you're able to radiate out. It's like your car parked in the sun. The temperature must rise. It must rise. There's no other way for it to go until the amount you're sending out, infrared, is equal to the amount that's coming in. People seem to be able to understand the whole concept of equilibrium. And if, if you can nail that, you're home even with skeptics. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that this brings, this is a great point to close on, is that all of us have our favorite slides to talk about how the world is getting warmer, Earth is getting warmer. We have our own comfort zone and what we feel we can explain. And so we probably don't have like Al Gore two hours to give the presentation. We need to present a couple of those slides that we feel comfortable giving and whether it be what, you know, Peter likes or what you would like here or what I personally like. I mean, I, I seldom use these slides, but in Miami last week, Al Gore spent a lot of time on these slides saying this was a very complex but critical set of slides. He highly recommended us to use them. And so I myself have been, okay, well, I'll maybe give it a second thought. But to your point, I, I have even stopped using this because of this long complexity fact. We don't have time in our presentations to, to necessarily get into the details. Let's give a hand to <laughs> Andrew. So I just want to if anybody wants any of the images that yeah. you saw here, um, I can create a slide deck and, and we can distribute it. I also just wanted to let you know that I've got a lot of the things relative to impacts in the Bay Area. Here's a picture of a storm surge in, in Hayward. And I can annotate these and distribute them. Would people, would that be helpful? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, let me say that, that uh, you gave a presentation in Sea Ranch last year, and it was a 90 minute video. I just uploaded it uh, to YouTube. So you can watch him give those slides that you saw just now on the local impacts, and we can do